So Romans chapter 10 and reading from verse 9. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And then Ephesians chapter 2 and reading from verse 14. For he, that is Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, Jew and Gentile, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Amen. Looking around, I can see that uh, there are some here who are old enough to remember May 1945 and V Day, Victory in Europe Day, and a time of uh, probably unprecedented celebration, I would imagine, in many ways, because never had the world been through such a horrific war. But now, finally, there was peace. Of course, I'm not old enough to remember that, but I've seen many pictures and uh, uh, film footage of the celebrations, particularly in London. And one image that sticks in my mind is uh, seeing a picture of, I'm not quite sure where it was in central London, but the whole street just to wash with people. Churchill kind of in the midst of them, and behind him, uh, some people clambering up lampposts and things. Standing at the top of the lampposts and raising their hands in the air in celebration at the victory that had come. And that the peace that was now going to ensue for Britain. But of course... It wasn't peace entirely at that time, was it? Because there was still a, a little matter of Japan. Japan was still very much at war, um, and that was something that still had to be dealt with. And of course, even then, it wasn't long before Churchill was going to make his great Iron Curtain speech about East and West. And so although there was peace of one kind, and an end to one type of hostility, there was in the... Uh, back of it as it were, it brought with it in the tail another kind of evil and more hostility and even the man who was climbing up the lamppost I love looking at old photos, I don't know about you I love to think about people that have gone before, maybe a hundred years ago, and you look at them and you see them there and you think, after that photo was taken, they went and they carried on with their life, I wonder what they gone up to, I wonder who they married, I wonder whether they had children, what their children were like, what sort of work did they do? I love to kind of imagine these things. We'll just think of the 
man on the lamppost. He climbed down, the celebrations died down, and he had to go and to pick up the pieces of life in peacetime. And of course, at the end of the war, rations were still in place, and life was hard. And it was hard, surely, for people to make ends meet. So V Day was a great day, but it didn't mean all is well. It didn't mean now everything is over. But of course, when we come to the Bible, and when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and when we read in verse 14, he himself is our peace, we can think of sins forgiven. And we can think of an end to hostility. An end to hostility between Jew and Gentile. And an end to hostility between God and man. And of course, that latter, that second, is the more important hostility that one must consider. Because without an end to the hostility between God and man, there can be no end to the hostility between man and man. And it's only through getting peace, being reconciled to God, that we can know true peace in our life. And though we must go on with this world, as it were, though we have many trials and difficulties to go through, if we have peace with our Maker, that is the greatest thing. That is far, far greater for the individual than the day. And there is a coming day, of course, when Christ returns or we depart to go to be with him, where we will be rid of everything still that hinders us from the pure worship of him. Now we looked at this before. We looked at, we've seen in verses 11 and 12, and we've looked at a kind of an overview of these verses, focusing upon that hostility between Jew and Gentile. We've done that a couple of times in a sense. Looking at those, uh, the hostility that has been there since the beginning between the Lord's people, the seed of the woman, and the seed of the serpent, going right back to the Garden of Eden and the fall of man. And we've considered that last week in a sort of general way. What I wanted to do today was to try to follow more uh, with the scripture verses in front of us here in Ephesians. Because, in a sense, to repeat what I said last week is an important thing to do. It is vital that we understand that Christ did not come to start a religion or to adapt a religion or adopt even a religion. If you want a new religion, go to the United States of America. New religions start almost daily there. All sorts of cults and wacky people with wacky ideas. Jesus did not come to start a religion, nor did he come to adapt one or even to adopt one. He came to finish what was promised, what was prophesied in the Old Testament. He was the fulfilment of all the law of God. He was the one who was promised to the seed or to the woman, even the God. The seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head, would restore humanity to God, would put right the wrong that was done, would be our Redeemer. And so, he didn't come to preach a, a new set of rules, or regulations, or a way of life. There is a way of life, there is a Christian way of life, isn't there? There are certain things that it isn't right for a Christian to do, of course. But that wasn't Christ's aim to come and set um, new laws or a way of life in place. He came to bring a new creation. That, if you are in Christ, is what you are today. A new creation in Him. Now this is something that each time you hear it, you should get excited by it. Excited at the fact that in Christ, I am a new creation. No more in condemnation. Let me ask you, get excited. If you don't get excited by these things, and over time, you've never really grasped it. You've never really fully understood it. Because it is the most wonderful thing. It is the most exciting, the most exhilarating thing one can ever, ever know. Not just know, but experience through belief, through faith in their hearts. 
If you've not grasped it, yet you've been coming here for some time. And who is at fault? Could it be that you're not hearing aright? Or could it be that I'm a poor speaker in bringing it to you? Either way, one thing we can say for sure, that God is not at fault. I could be at fault. You could be at fault. God is not at fault. Because his word is very, very clear on these things. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. It's what the word of God says. Now this is something that, as I say, should excite us. But not like a child gets excited at Christmas. I have a daughter who, at Christmas time, being very young, went to bed and started screaming. Why was she screaming? Running up the stairs to find out, thinking the house was on fire. She's screaming because she's so excited about Christmas. That's great. That's great. But Christmas comes and goes. The Christian should be excited with a growing excitement. And maybe that sometimes you just want to, yeah, let loose as it were. Stand on the rooftops and proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ with a maturity (laughs) of understanding. But that's how we should be, isn't it? It is with us daily, not like Christmas that comes and goes. The joy of this new creation, this new life, that we are now different. I'm not what I once was. If you knew me, you would say, it is incredible what God has done. Those of, well, there's only pretty one person here who knows what I was really like. It is an incredible thing what God has done in my life. And it's incredible in everyone's life. How he takes us and how he transforms us. There was a man, he's known as a, an early church father. Which means he was one of the Christians in the first centuries, in the formative centuries of the church. His name was Augustine. He's not the one who came over on a boat here to Canterbury. He's known as Augustine of Hippo. Uh, often known as Saint Augustine. And he was converted a bit later on in life, I think he was in his 30s, I think he was 35 when he was converted. But he lived a, a really a horrendous life. And it wasn't unknown for him to go and to uh, visit prostitutes and such like. One day he's walking along the road and a voice sings out and says, Augustine! Augustine! And he carries on walking and she calls out again, Augustine! Augustine! It is I! says the prostitute. But he carries on walking the other way and does not acknowledge her. And she calls out again and he turns and he says, but it is no longer I. And he keeps going. He's a different man. Completely transformed because he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And so the believer is not someone who looks the way they used to. In terms of looking downward, just looking at this world. They look upward, heavenward, to Christ. He's not someone who acts the way they used to. Someone now who is transformed. Yes, you can talk about rules and regulations, but they're not governed by these things. They're governed in their inner spirit by the Holy Spirit. Who leads and guides them on the right path. And so the Christian hears, and hears again, hears at Christmas time, sings joy to the world, that Christ, they proclaim, has come, a newborn child into this world. And they hear, and they rejoice. They don't just rejoice because tinsel, they don't just rejoice because turkey, they rejoice because the Saviour is born. And they're reminding themselves of these things. So if they're a true Christian, they don't just remember it at Christmas, they remember these things throughout the year. And the Christian hears what Christ came into this world to do, what he's done. And there's a sense of great satisfaction in their heart. As they read the words that Christ said from the cross, it is finished. They say, hallelujah. My sin is washed away. But then of course as they consider what Christ went through on the cross and why he had to go to that cross to bear away their sin and take upon himself the wrath of God, they have a mix of emotions because as they hear these things, they hang their head in shame and they squirm because they're reminded once again of what they were. 
and of what but for the grace of God they can still be from time to time because sin, sin is still there within them but then they hear the resurrection and they want to shout for joy they want to proclaim from the rooftops and now they want to say again hallelujah, hallelujah and amen and their heart is filled with joy is that you? is that you as you consider these things? now I know that we are not necessarily always hot on these things. We're not always uh, on fire for the Lord. We have to stir ourselves up. But as you read, as you meditate, as you consider these things, does it do that to your heart? Do you experience that when you're there and you're reading the Word of God and you're thinking about what He has done? Does it fill your heart with joy? Because it should do. And the result should be that you have a new resolve, that you want to please the one who died for you. And you have this new resolve to remove from your life anything that would hinder you running the race that he has set before you. Getting rid of sin from your life. Living a life that is pleasing to him. And so we read in verse 14, Christ himself, Ephesians 2, Christ himself is our peace. And I want to look at that this morning, look, how, look at how he's our peace through verses 15 and 16. Let's just read those verses. Christ abolishes the law in his flesh, the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in his body to reconcile both of them to God. Through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. And so, I want us to consider these two verses this morning especially. Consider them through the eyes of the cross, or through uh, the hill, or from the hill of Calvary as it were. Looking at Christ crucified. And we can think of many things that Christ accomplished through the crucifixion. But here this morning I would suggest to you that three stand out from these verses. Abolition, creation and reconciliation. And so firstly, in the first part of verse 15 it says, By abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments. Abolition. Abolition. Now we've looked at this in great detail before, so I'm not going to uh, revisit that in any great way this morning. But just to remind ourselves that on the cross, on the cross, Christ must die. Because Jew and Gentile were hostile to one another. And what separated them was the law. The law. Now, it was twisted by the Jews of Jesus' day to think that they were somehow superior people. But we've looked at all that. But what Christ did on the cross was he removed the separation, that which separated Jew from Gentile. He removed the curse of the law. Now, can you pass the moral law test? Is there anyone here who could pass the test of the moral law? What you must do is look to the Ten Commandments. I don't know about heating this one, Josh. It feels like a What you must do is look to the Ten Commandments especially and work your way through them and ask yourself, have I kept that commandment? Have I loved the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, being and strength? That's the first four commandments. Have I loved my neighbour as myself? That's the second six commandments. Have I done those things in action, in word, and in thought? And of course, as we have considered many times, we all must say, no, if we are honest. I have failed miserably, and I still fail miserably. But thanks be to God, Christ knew no sin. He kept that moral law. He passed that test 100%. Because even if there's someone here who could say, well, I'm 99%, they'd probably be a liar. 
But even if there was such a person who was slightly deceived in their mind, as to think, 99%, that's not bad. Yes, but you know, the pass rate with God, who is perfect, is 100%. That is why God, who so loved the world, must send his one and only Son, otherwise we cannot be saved. It is only the love of God that constrains him. Not any duty or requirement that he must. It is the love of God that constrains him to send his Son into this world. To keep that moral law 100%. And then of course you remember the ceremonial laws. Remember how we looked at them and we saw that the ceremonial laws, they all point to Christ. All the ritual, all the temple sacrifice, all the special clothing, all the uh, different things, the festivals, the feast days. All of them in some way pointed to Christ. And Christ therefore, he was the fulfilment of them. Read through Leviticus. Quite hard to read some of the uh, accounts in there. Uh, of the setting out of the law. The ceremonial law given to Moses as he sets it to the people. But as you read it, think, Christ, my Saviour, fulfilled that. He was the one that was pointed to. And when you read it in the light of Christ, and particularly with Hebrews, and another Bible beside you, you see the wonder the glory of these things and the majesty that this was something that God planned from eternity past because Christ fulfilled those laws it's a bit like a company I used to work for that used to dispatch goods you could buy things from them and they had a department that would be basically the, the place where they would wrap everything up and send it from. And they decided they wanted to give this department a special name. Not just dispatch. They wanted to call it something else. So they came up with the name Fulfillment. And that sounded quite a good name really. Fulfillment. The Fulfillment Department. Because basically there's all these orders, all these goods that need going out. All these things that have got to be picked. And then they've got to be wrapped. And they've got to be labelled. And then they've got to be sent out. And when they're sent out, that order is fulfilled. Do you need to do it again? No. If it's been done once, it's fulfilled. It's been dispatched. It's been sent. Because Christ died once for sin. Died once to fulfill all these laws. It has been fulfilled. All God's purpose in Christ. There is no more need of sacrifice. There is no more need of any repeat of these things. We go to Christ daily. Just as the disciples. Jesus showed them. The washing of the hands and the feet. We go to Jesus daily for the cleansing of sin. But not for justification all over again. We don't go to be saved all over again. We go just for that washing, so that our focus is right, so that we're clean, so that we're pure daily. But Christ died once, and we are justified, we are saved once. And Christ, in fulfilling the law, therefore he removed that which separates Jew and Gentile. He abolished it. He abolished the law in that sense. He removed it forever but then secondly we see in verse 15 a creation an act of creation first part he abolished in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations his purpose his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two thus making peace was an act of creation. Now think of the miracles that Jesus did when he walked the earth in his humanity. How many miracles can you think of that Jesus did that you can say, well, that was an act of creation? How many? What about where he gives sight to the person who's blind? Well, in a sense, that's just restoring sight, isn't it? Perhaps it wasn't there even when they were born. But again, it's just restoring what is usual to humanity. Assuming there were eyes there, he just, he just made them work. What a great miracle that was. But it's a kind of an act of restoration. What about Lazarus? Lazarus was dead. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus was alive. That wasn't really an act of creation, was it? Because
because Lazarus had lived before and Lazarus was merely, if I can put it that way, coming back to life. Merely coming back to life. But you know, of course, the life that Lazarus was merely coming back to was one where, if you pinch me, it will hurt. If you slap me hard enough, it will bleed. If you afflict me with something, I will have disease. I will have illness. My brother Gary prayed for people in our church who are ill at this time. Lazarus was raised back to that mortal life. And so that wasn't an act of creation, was it? Here's one. Water into wine. I would suggest to you that that was an act of creation on Christ's part. Because what normally happens, you take water, but then you have to add other ingredients to that water. And it has to go through the fermenting stage, and goodness knows what else it goes through, before it comes out the end as wine. But remember, Jesus at the wedding banquet... What does he do? He tells them to get some vessels, some stone jars, used for ceremonial washing, and to fill them with water. He doesn't say put in some uh, berries, or put in this kind of fruit, or put in that kind of fruit, put in lots of sugar, put in these things, and shake it a bit, and I'll pray. He doesn't do any of that. He just tells them to get the water. And when the water is poured, it is, I would suggest to you, an act of Creation, Because from that water, Christ has created wine. But here I would suggest to you that at the end of verse 15, we're introduced to a far, far greater act of creation than just water into wine. We're introduced into the new creation, the new humanity. There is Jew, there is Gentile. There is the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent. Two types of humanity. But both of them are under sin. Both of them are smitten with the disease of this world that will lead to death. What does Christ do? Christ creates a third humanity. A second Adam, we might say. To start all over again. One who will ultimately be without sin, for he is without sin. Verse 14, let's just read it, sorry, verse 15. Let's just read it. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, out of the Jew and the Gentile, or the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, whichever way you want it. One new man out of the two, thus making peace. And if you look at verse 14, it doesn't say, for he himself came to make peace. It says, he himself is our peace. This is the amazing thing, isn't it? That should always stun us. That God the Son comes into this world. He who's created the world. He who sustains it. He who is almighty. All-knowing, all-wise, takes on humanity, makes himself frail in a sense, dependent on a woman, the birth. Why does he do this? He does this so that in him, a new humanity can be born. In him, a peace that is lasting, not for ye A peace that is lasting. <coughs> That's what Christ came to do. He creates a new humanity. Not just by being gentle Jesus in the manger. But by being the suffering saviour. Hanging upon the cross. Bleeding and dying. In his death comes our life. And so he creates through the cross a new Adam. And of course, I don't want to leave Christ dead and in a tomb. Three days later, he rises from the dead, doesn't he? Up from the grave, he rises. He's victorious, conquering over death. And that new humanity now reigns in him. 
We're all in Christ. The moment they believe, are given this new life, this new heart, and they can sing, I am a new creation, no more in condemnation. The body, yes, it's still the tent, it's weary and falling and failing, but what awaits them when Christ returns is a new body, taken from this somehow, just like the water into wine. I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he will do it. But your body will be raised or transformed if it returns while you're still living. Will be transformed into Christ's resurrection body. The new Adam. And your heart is undergoing that renewal already. It's been renewed. You're in a warfare, aren't you? A state of warfare. Because the old you is still there. The sinful you is still there. Must be put down. And so we fight. And we wrestle. Now here's someone who's patriotic for their country. They like to sing, Rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. But now, in Christ, they have a higher citizenship. They're no longer just out for England. They want England to win the World Cup, maybe. But it's no longer just England. They're united to Christ. They proclaim, I am a citizen of heaven. A citizen of heaven. Isn't that a wonderful thing? This is a temporary place, isn't it? And it's, your time here is less with each passing moment. But if you're in Christ, you're a citizen of heaven. And so the Christian says, before all else, yes, I love my country, but before all else, I am a Christian. Before, I was all for self. I was all for my family. I was all for my country. But now, I'm all for Jesus. Are you all out for Jesus? Do you love him with all your heart? Is it your desire to love him more? Turn to Luke, chapter 14. Please. Verse 26. Large crowds in verse 25. We read large crowds were travelling with Jesus and turning to them he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his mother and father, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, there isn't time to look into the word hate there, but just accept it for now at this, that Christ must be number one. It's not that you are to reject your family or anything like that. Christ isn't saying that. But he's saying, I'm to be number one. Now, is he number one in your heart and your life this day? Look at verse 33. In the same way, any of you, who does not give up everything he has, cannot be my disciple. Again, a verse that can be abused and people use it to um, make riches, make money out of people who are vulnerable, who misunderstand these words. It's quite easy to preach from these words and say, therefore, come on, give all your riches, fill my bag. And that's been done tragically throughout history and abuse of the word of God. But take those words. Anyone who does not give up everything he has. Cannot be my disciple. Let me just say in short. It is the person on their knees. Able to say. Lord everything I have is yours. I give it all to you. To do with it as you will. And then if God says. Well I will take that from you. So be it Lord. So be it. Says the person who has died to self, who has been willing to give up everything he has for the Lord. The person who hasn't may say the prayer, but when God takes that from them, they cry, no, 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 Lord, that Lord, no, not that particular thing. Now, it may be something.
something that's sinful, but it's something that's so close to their heart that they could not bear to be without it. Let me ask you, are there things in your life that you have not or would not be willing to surrender to God? You see, Christ must be Lord of all of your life. He demands all. And it may be that he may demand that very thing that you are unwilling to give up. But you must do so. And you find that actually only truly in giving it up can you ever really come to fully appreciate it. If he doesn't take it from you. Because you do so from a heart that is given in its entirety to him. And Christ is number one. And so... Christ makes us a new creation. He brings us into and makes us part of an undivided body where there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. No Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised. Christ is all and in all. Christ comes to create this new humanity. And if you are in him, then you are a new creation. And then thirdly, in verse 16, we read of reconciliation. Having made one new man out of the two, in this one body, representing all of humanity in a sense, all who will ever come to him, in this one body, to recon- reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. And so he takes this new humanity in himself, in his own person. He takes upon himself the sin of everyone who will ever believe in him. And he reconciles us to God through suffering on the cross. For on that cross... The wrath of God, we've sung it, for on that cross, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. And Christ punished his son so that out of his love for us, he shouldn't have to punish us. It says here, he put to death their hostility. Literally, he killed it, he slew it. There's the hostility, the law. He's put it to death. But also, that hostility, the enmity, sin, separating God from man. Through the cross, Christ comes to do this. The punishment, Isaiah 53 tells us, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. So all our hostility to God, and as a consequence, all our hostility to man, is slain. It is no more. So that means we can say, well I can ask you the question, what are the first words that Christ brings to his disciples after he's risen from the dead? It's in John chapter 20. What are the first words? He sees the women... But then he comes and he appears, doesn't he, to his disciples. And in John chapter 20, uh, you read in verse 19, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Here his first words to his disciples. After he rose from the dead, Peace be with you. It's more than just a greeting. It's a fact. Peace is now theirs between God and them because Christ has died. He's paid the price for sin. Verse 20 tells us he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they, overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So having achieved That peace on the cross. Peace with the Father. And therefore a reconciliation between man and man. He announces it. He announces it first to his disciples. But here Paul tells us 
He came and preached in verse 17, Peace to you who were far away, you Gentiles who were far away, and then to us Jews who were near. Paul's just doing that because he's speaking to the Gentiles. Christ spoke to his apostles first. And then through his apostles, he spoke to the Jews. And through one apostle especially, through Paul, he began to speak to the Gentiles. That same message of peace and reconciliation. He came and preached peace to you who were far away. And peace to those who were near. And so through Christ alone, striving cease. Because man is reconciled to God and therefore reconciled to man. Verse 14 tells us that Christ is our peace. Verse 15 tells us that he created a new humanity to make peace. And he does that through the cross, through his own suffering and his own death. But now in verse 17... He preaches that peace. And so from our perspective, two points of application I would like to bring to you. The first one we looked at in much detail last week, so just briefly this time, is that if we have peace with God, if we claim to know God, and we claim to have peace with Him, then we must have peace with one another. Peace with our fellow mankind. If you are a part of Christ, you are a new creation. It is a natural characteristic of the new creation. Paul says in Colossians, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since, of mem- since as members of one body you were called to peace. Let the peace of God, or the peace of Christ, sorry, let the peace of Christ rule. Rule in your hearts. What does that suggest? It suggests that in that new creation, the heart of flesh, the heart of stone is gone. The heart of flesh, a new creation is born. Which is a heart of peace. Peace is part of the package if you want. Peace is part of that new heart. Let it reign, let it rule in your hearts. That peace of Christ that he brings... So it's not something that you've got to go and get, like you buy something in a supermarket. It's something that comes with a new creation. Yes, you've got to stir it up. You've got to fire it up, as it were. You've got to walk in peace. You've got to exercise peace. You've got to look into your heart and analyse and say, well, are there things that I'm still at enmity with my man about, my fellow man about? Are there things I need to do, things I need to put right? Because how can we expect God to bless us if we don't do so? In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, and there was a church that was hostile, live in peace, says Paul, and the God of peace, sorry, the God of love and peace will be with you. Don't live in peace and you won't experience God's peace. Because God will not be pleased to bless you with a sense of his presence and his power if you're not living in peace with those around you. And that's peace with believers. 1 Thessalonians 5.13 tells us, live in peace with each other. And then if you turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says in verse 3, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Peace amongst the fellowship. Peace amongst believers. Peace within the church. But also peace with others. With those outside the church. Hebrews 12, 14. Make every effort... To live in peace with all men. And so, therefore, remembering what Christ has done for us. 
How he has taken that hostility between us and God upon himself and removed it. And has therefore given us this heart of peace wherein we can have peace with one another. Let us be peacemakers. Let us examine our hearts and be sure that we are walking in peace. And then secondly, the the second piece of application, peace, peace, the second point of application. Take the message of peace. Take it. Verse 17, he came and preached peace to you, that's Christ, who were far away, and peace to those who were near. Through the apostles. He did it himself initially, but then through the apostles. And still today, through us, he gives us his message. And he tells us to go into all the world and to make disciples of all nations. We read from Romans chapter 10. You might like to turn to it because we'll look at that in a moment. But we read from uh, Romans chapter 10 and a verse that is in Isaiah 52. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace. And in Romans 10 and verse 9 you have that wonderful verse there. If you confess with your mouth... Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not just a simple, Jesus is Lord, anyone can say that. It's the implications of what lies behind such a confession. Paul's day, to say Jesus is Lord when you've got a man emperor, Nero, hot on your tail. Caesar is Lord. No, no, says the Christian. Jesus is Lord. Certain death. I'm not going to say that lightly. Today it's easy to say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. But what does it mean? What lies behind it? The gospel message of reconciliation between a God who is wrathful, for a humanity that is sinful, and enmity with him. Christ removing that barrier and bringing peace. How is he doing? Understanding, comprehending the gospel. And then believing In your heart. That God raised him from the dead. In other words that he conquered. That his death was sufficient. His death satisfied the wrath of God. And that it is a a fait accompli. That is the message isn't it? That is the message we take to the world. The gospel message. But then we read on and we read that how can they believe? How can people out there believe? Or how can they call rather on the one they've not believed in? They don't know him. How can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? They've not heard of him. They think of Jesus as a little baby in a, in a, uh, a manger at Christmas time. They don't really understand Easter apart from chocolate. They don't understand the message and the centrality of the cross. It's just something you wear around your neck, isn't it? And you have on tops of buildings that we call churches. Which of course are just buildings. Don't understand these things. If there is a God, then all roots lead to him. You can follow Muhammad, you can follow Buddha, you can follow Krishna. Or you can follow Jesus. Really, he's best just using a swear word. That's what people say out there. Because they know nothing of him. How can they believe in the one they've not heard? How can they hear them without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach... Unless they are sent. And you see, your job, your job, and mine, but yours, is to take it to them. Go into all the world. You've been sent. Christ has sent you. Go into all the world and make disciples amongst the nations. Go. Go. That's what the Word of God says. If you don't go, who will? Who will tell these people that are perishing in their sin? So we have this great responsibility. We are to go into a world that is perishing. We're not to preach peace in the sense of east and west, north and south. Don't fight one another. Put your weapons away. 
We can leave that to others. We have a higher message to proclaim that ultimately will bring peace between East and West, North and South. Maybe not in this world, because this is a, a, an age and a world that is fallen, it is decaying, it is going to be swept aside. The peace we have to bring, the reconciliation we have to proclaim, is far, far greater than V Day. If you can imagine every war sort of pummeled into one, one great V Day. What a celebration that would be. That's nothing compared to the peace that the Christian holds in his heart. You have that message of truth in your heart. Go and proclaim it. The world needs to hear. If you will not tell them, they will not hear. They will not know. And your blood, rather their blood, will be on your shoulders. Only the gospel brings true, lasting peace. Only we've got the ultimate answer. Peace between God and man. The new creation which brings peace between man and man. And we can then say all warfare does cease. So let's take that message of peace. And let's seek opportunities to do so. But you sit there and you say, yes, I want to. I get stirred by these things. But I fear. I'm frightened. Well, what are you frightened of? What is it that you are scared of in taking it? Some people say, well, I get dumbstruck. I'm, I'm frightened of, of not knowing what to say. I'm frightened that the words won't come, that I'll, I'll get confused. I'll be just flabbergasted. I'll be overcome. Our nerves will get me. And I won't say what I want to. You know what Peter says, don't you? Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the hope that you have. Do this with gentleness and respect. Recognising, but for the grace of God, that would be I. But always be prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared. How do I prepare myself? I prepare myself by contemplating these things. Contemplating the message of salvation. So that it just swamps me, as it were. Overwhelms me. It's as close and as dear to me as my right hand. You say, yes, but some people... Like that lady you were talking to on Tuesday. They, they want to talk about evolution. And I don't understand all of those things. I don't understand about that. But I would say to you that most people you would speak to who say, oh, I, I think evolution is the answer, they haven't got a clue either. Most people you speak to know nothing about evolution. They couldn't explain the theory of it, really. And what they don't know more than anything, that there was no facts to back it up. That's the most infuriating thing. They're missing links. Where are they? But you need to be assured that there are answers. When someone, even who says, I know a lot about evolution, starts to speak and you think, well, perhaps they do know a lot about it. There are answers. The Bible has them, of course. But there are also Christians who have scientific minds, a scientific understanding, and they hold overwhelmingly to the creation account in the Bible. And they say there is much evidence all around to back it up. Point them in the direction of such literature, such websites. But do this. When you have opportunity to witness to someone who says, I am an evolutionist, talk about design. Talk about the creation. Because I think that's just an overwhelming example of God. That everything has a creator. The watch I'm wearing, because I've lost mine, has a creator, has a maker. Everything has a maker. Oh, no, 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 not the universe. The universe was poof. Well, it was probably louder than that. It was a big bang, wasn't it? And then a chance thing. That's what it was, a little chance, wasn't it? What a load of nonsense. What a load of nonsense. Study these things. Contemplate them. Meditate 
on design. Read the Psalms, where the psalmist speaks about God's creation. And the wonder of it. You say, well, I'm no good at speaking. Nor was Moses. Moses wasn't very good at speaking, was he? And he led Israel out of Egypt. And God knows if you're not going, or you think you're not very good at speaking, God knows what you're capable of. God knows what you can do, and he will equip you. And I'm afraid that's where faith comes in. You have to step out in faith. It's all about faith, isn't it? Saying, Lord, I am willing. I don't feel equipped, but I believe by faith that you can equip me. And so I go. Fear, you know, fear begins the day, doesn't it? When there's a day of things that are grave responsibilities. Fear begins the day. You wake up and there's butterflies, it's there. But it doesn't end the day, does it? You go to bed triumphant, because you've conquered through that day. And so it is with the saints. There's the saints, and there's an opportunity to witness. And butterflies grip at them right at the start. That's normal. That's natural. That's part and parcel of being given a great responsibility. It's something we all experience. But it goes. It's good that it's there. Because it keeps us on our toes. Otherwise, ha ha, yeah, it's me now. I'm going to talk about evolution. I'm going to... We get all bullshit. We get overconfident. We start to think that, oh, I can do this. Look at me, there's a person with a penalty. <laughs> I can do this backward with my eyes closed. Because he's scored so many penalties. But he's got overconfident. And it's the World Cup final, and it's the one that will win the cup for his country. And he goes and he misses it. Because he's overconfident. But butterflies keeps him low. Keeps him dependent. I'm talking about the Christian now. Keeps the Christian dependent, looking to God. And as he begins to speak, so he finds, or she finds, God comes and gives them things to say. Well, where did that come from? And gives them confidence as they speak. Meditate upon the gospel. Meditate upon that message. Worship God for it. You know, in Deuteronomy, I won't read it now, but in Deuteronomy, it speaks about how the law is to be something that's to be on their hearts. Tells about how they should put them on their doorposts and on their garden gates and such like, the, the scriptures, as it were. They're to wear little boxes that remind them of these things, of God's ways. And they're to meditate upon them often as they're walking down the road and so on. And that's how we must be with the gospel message of Christ Jesus and him crucified. Our minds should be taken up with these things. So that it's, it's second nature to us in a sense. Oh, I don't know what to say if someone asks me a awkward question. Stick to scripture. Stick to the gospel. Don't worry about people talking about all sorts of philosophies and so on. Get them to Christ. By that I mean, talk about sin. Talk about judgment, the bad news. And speak about the cross. Speak about redemption. And trust that as you do so, knowing what you know, knowing that it's been a sweet form of meditation to you, knowing that it's delighted your own heart, that as you do so, your heart is delighted by it all over again. And it's even more delighted because someone is listening to what you're saying. Someone who desperately needs this. Meditate upon it. Eat, drink, live and breathe the gospel. When an opportunity comes, take the plunge. The water only appears icy. When you plunge into it, it's like Mediterranean in summer. Even warm. <laughs> Even warmer. And the Spirit comes, and He gives you what one can only describe as an exhilarating encounter. You say, yeah, but I, I want to be liked. And I know that when Christians start witnessing, they're... You know, people don't like that sort of thing. And I want to be liked. I would say with Isaiah, stop trusting in man who has but a breath in his nostrils. Of what account is he? And Jesus, let's remind ourselves, he said if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they didn't like me, they won't like you. What you have to do is remember, remind yourself, 
Is it, is it better to be liked by God or by man? What's more important? Being sure, of course, that the reason they don't like you is not because you've been horrible or nasty or thrashed them or whatever, but because it is the message that you've seek, sought to bring, the message of Christ, that you've sought to bring with gentleness, with persuasion, but with gentleness, and with love. If it's that they hate you for, praise God. For so they persecuted Christ, so they persecuted the apostles. If it's your personality that is... Uh, you're allowing to be dark and nasty, then rebuke yourself for it. But if it's the former, rejoice. Rejoice. When someone says, I don't want to be ridiculed. I don't like the idea of being ridiculed. And Christians are often ridiculed. What does Jesus say? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of his holy angels. Consider what is more important. This world or your place in the kingdom of heaven. What's more important? Living for now? This world, this life now is like a weekend, isn't it? I won't point to them, but ask the oldest person who's here. How old are you now? They'd be a bit rude to ask, I suppose. But if you consider the oldest person here, how old they are. You think, wow, that's a long, long time. Young Abby would think that's a lot of years. Hannah, if she could comprehend that, would think that's an incredible number of years. A week is a long time to Hannah. <laughs> but ask the person who's the oldest here. It's just flown by. It's like a weekend. What have I lived for? This world? My place in his kingdom. Pray for a greater love of God's word. And pray for a greater love for the giver of God's word. Pray for a greater love of Christ. Seek him, worship him, love him. Pray. Pray that God would burden your heart more and more for a greater concern for the lost. And meditate, meditate on the people who are shopping today. Meditate on where they are going. They have an eternal, eternal destination. And at the moment, it is a termination. It's not a good one. And that's not termination as in all things cease. That is judgment and hell. The wrath of God is only satisfied upon a sinner who is without Christ for all eternity. Meditate on that. As Jesus said, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Let us go, therefore, in his strength and make disciples. Amen.